And good evening to everyone. Um, Lenga is my name. I'm uh, currently working with Lusaka Pex Medical University, Department of Radiation Sciences, Ultrasound Department. Uh, I, today's discussion is a, about the role of ultrasound in hand glands deformity. Uh, I'll briefly just discuss about this. Uh, for those of you who have been practicing imaging for some time, I know there are seniors in here. I think there is nothing new about it, except I just want to put some things in, in context so that uh, we may help our clients uh, at different levels. Uh, I picked on this case, or rather this topic, uh, because at times we we underutilize ultrasound and half the time we don't help the patients when they come with certain conditions. This could be our families, this could be ourselves. A lot of us can have this condition, but I, I, I just want to make it more practical and looking at this case. So I had three cases which I wanted to share. Uh, I personally did these cases, but due to some logistics, and some IT issues, I couldn't retrieve the images. Nevertheless, uh, these were case, case series. Uh, they involved about three patients who I followed. I worked with the orthopedic surgeon. So we looked at these cases and I felt I would share something with colleagues so that we can enhance and sharpen our ultrasound. Uh, I know there are people who are practicing musculoskeletal ultrasounds. Uh, both in diaspora, uh, locally, and in, within the neighboring countries. So Hangland's deformity or syndrome is, is a deformity that involves the heel bone or the calcaneus. And maybe before I, I even define, my, my objectives are very straightforward. I would define what Hangland's deformity is, briefly discuss about the, the anatomy, the case series, clinical symptoms, how it appears on a plain x-ray, ultrasound findings, and generally general comments. And I'll conclude. Um, I wish to finish on time so that we can have more discussions and experience about this. So, by definition, Hangland's deformity is a bone deformity that occurs at the back of the foot. And it typically, it involves uh, the adjacent structures that tend to occur there, be it the literal calcaneal uh, buses and the subcutaneous buses that are involved. And the main topic here, or the main structure that is involved is the Achilles tendon. It's one of the tendons that is a thick and strong tendon in the lower limb posterior to the leg. Uh, it has got its origin, which has to be understood, and its insertion. It originates from the, the calf or the, the proximal portion. Uh, it has two parts. On the medial side, it has the gastronomous muscle. Then on the lateral side, it has got the soleus muscle. Together, they run distally to come and insert at the superior portion of the, the calcaneus. So our discussion really will based on the Achilles tendon and its insertion. It's this insertion which inserts at the aponeurosis of the calcaneum bone. So this is where we are going to base. I should be quick to mention that the anatomy of the ankle joint is quite sophisticated and complex. And there are a number of structures that plays a role in the anatomy itself. And the presentation or the clinical symptoms of this hang lens deformities may not be specific. That's why at times where patients will complain of pain and you may not really know exactly what to look at. So this hang lungs deformity, it will appear as an enlargement of the bony section of the heel bone, meaning, hello, 
meaning one has to understand or have a thorough understanding of the anatomy of the heel bone. Practically, you have to understand the ankle joint and its bone related and the structures that are involved. So typically, it occurs where the Achilles tendon insets. You realize that the Achilles tendon, like I mentioned, having those structures and its origin from the, the calf muscle, it goes and insets at the aponeurosis, just at the superior portion of the, of the, of the calcaneus. Hence, we really have to understand the Achilles tendon in, in all the views and its anatomy. And uh, you also realize that uh, the, the soleus muscle, which is laterally located, and the gastronomus, which is medially located, tends to have this relationship with the calcaneus. So some other conditions may also present within the, the structures that are involved. You also have to realize that there are also nerves that are involved here. There are also ligaments, muscles, and tendons that are involved. So once you understand the anatomy, it, it becomes easy to pick. Again, I should also mention that time, sometimes you do an x-ray, depending on the clinician's request, and you don't see much of the things. But half the time, ultrasound may play a role to pick most of the things. So there are three things that a patient may present with typically for you to diagnose this Hanglands syndrome. So a patient will present with distal Achilles tendon abnormality that you can visibly see with your eyes. You see a protrusion or a bumpy on the heel bone. When you look at them, it may be either bilateral or unilateral, but typically the patient will have this bumpy appearance on the back of their heel and they will, they will, they will, they will talk about pain. And again, I should also mention here that it's not really the bumpy or the, the bony enlargement that causes pain, but it's the irritation because this is where the, the Achilles tendon insets. So it's that bony protuberance that now irritates the, the, the Achilles tendon and the adjacent soft tissues around. So sometimes you can have this bumpy on your back of your heel and you don't have pain. So there are mechanisms that may exacerbate or contribute to the pain that may come. Uh, most of them may involve, maybe somebody was used to wear heels and suddenly they changed to start wearing flat shoes. Sometimes this person was a runner, used to do some exercise and suddenly they changed their activities, they tend to just do the flatty, flat uh, running and then just walking like that. So there are quite a number of mechanisms that may cause the pain. Uh, the point I'm trying to drive at is you can have this bumpy bony protuberance that may appear, but if the, the tendon and the, the calcaneal uh, aponeurosis center portion, they don't adapt to that, you may end up having this pain which may just come suddenly. Remember the retrocalcaneal bursa that are involved there. They are supposed to be there or their main function is to reduce the friction that may occur between the bone and the calcaneal tendon. So really the mechanism may present differently. So the second thing that you notice that adjacent to the bursa there, there, there will be some distension or the bursa itself will distend depending on the uh, adaptation that may occur. So this may involve the retrocalcaneal and the retro Achilles basa that are involved. And then the, the third point which I mentioned is the prominence of the posterior superior of the calcaneus that you can see on an x-ray and even visibly. And the patients that I'm talking about, I think two of them presented with the protuberance. One was unilateral, the other one was bilateral. And then what was interesting about this other patient was that on the other leg, there was pain. On the other one, there was no pain. When we did both x-rays, we could see the protuberance which were there. So we also have to understand such. So the, the protuberance that I'm talking about of so Hanglands deformity, it's, it's this. This was bilaterally. You can see the location where it is. It's on the bilateral, it's, it's on the posterior, posterior portion of the calcaneus. You all agree with me that this is the, the portion where you have the, the posterior calcaneal 
part of it. It's very visible and you can see. Then on the lateral part, you can see that uh, despite uh, uh, the normal anatomy here, you can see that there's some, some protuberance that, uh, that appear in there. So that prominence, that is what we are referring to, the hanglands deformity. And uh, sometimes it's very common in females. Uh, they call it the bumpy bump deformity because of the shoes that they wear. Sometimes it tends to irritate this. It's also common for those people who like wearing tight shoes with no proper back support. Uh, so it also goes to that. So it's basically the irritation and you have this. This doesn't happen on one or two days. It's a chronic kind of, of, of deformity that will come. Uh, and this has to do with the, your activities and the, the type of shoes that you normally wear that may put you at risk to have that. So still, I still want to show the schematic diagram. So you find that this is our Achilles tendon. This is, it originates from the calf, like I mentioned, and then it comes and instates on the posterior portion of the calcaneus. This is our calcaneus bone. And then this is the literal calcaneum, uh, our literal tendon that you find. And um, this is the bursa that I, I was talking about. So this can be irritated depending on how this protrusion may be. So the bone enlargement we are talking about is the posterior portion, the posterior superior portion of the calcaneus. So it may enlarge and this enlargement may actually compress and compromise um, the, the friction or the cushion which this vessel may, may play in a normal person. So this irritation tends to occur just around here. So this anatomy is very key. You can see this X-ray, uh, it's showing the calcaneus. Then there's that prominence that you can see and the, it's been depicted clinically as, as, as that. So this anatomy becomes very key to understand. So ultrasound typically assesses the posterior ankle. Uh, again, I will mention that in musculoskeletal ultrasound, uh, when you are evaluating the whole ankle joint, we do the anterior compartment, medial compartment, lateral compartment, and the posterior compartment. Uh, the presentation for today, I just want to look at the posterior compartment on its own because it's more specific on hang lungs deformities. However, if there will be need to discuss the anterior, the lateral and the medial compartment, we may still arrange for that presentation so that we understand the ankle ultrasound and how much we can see this. So basically the abnormalities of the Achilles tendon may involve the tendon itself or the surrounding tissues. And the surrounding tissues I've talked about is the retrocalcaneo, the subcutaneous bursa and the, the tendon itself. You may also have other uh, pathologies that may present like paratendinitis, uh, tendinopathies, Achilles, and all those. Sometimes you can also have the tear. It can be a full thickness tear, partial thickness tear that may present. Ultrasound also plays a role when it comes to dynamic assessment. And by dynamic assessment, I mean it gives you a room to assess the ligament, the tendon itself in motion. You can dorsiflex or plantarflex the, and you, you are able to assess the tendon itself in real time. So you are able to see the continuity of the, of the normal anatomy of the tendon, which MRI cannot do. You realize that MRI, you have to have static images, but ultrasound has this advantage of dynamic assessment of the, of the Achilles tendon, which, which becomes very advantageous when you, when you compare to these other modalities. But again, I should also acknowledge here that the MRI becomes superior to ultrasound, like you may, as you may be aware, when it comes to soft tissue assessment. But how many people can, as, can, can access MRI? I think the issue of economical um, affording and all those things becomes very crucial. So uh, a plain X-ray becomes key. They do a plain X-ray, but an X-ray again, you realize that it won't show you the soft tissue abnormalities and the ligament and all those. So ultrasound becomes uh, very handy when it comes to that. So 
what is the anatomy of this Achilles? So, like I've mentioned, I've talked about all these things. You have to know the origin and the insertion, the bursa involved, and the heel bone itself when you want to evaluate the posterior portion of the of the of the ankle joint. So again, you realize that the Achilles tendon, it should be mentioned here that it doesn't have the true sheath of the tendon itself. It has this combination of other structures that run concurrently when it comes to that. So some of the things that you need to understand that uh, there are the soleus fibers that comes into play, the Achilles tendon itself. There's also the Cagas fat part that comes into play. That should not be mistaken to a pathology. And then you also have the literal calcaneal bursa that becomes here and the subcutaneous. You tend to have the subcutaneous bursa just around here that has to be assessed as well. Again, once you have the knowledge of these anatomies, it becomes easy to identify certain structures that comes into play. Because if you don't know these structures sometimes, they may present or give you a challenge and even mimic some of the presentation that, that may appear to be like a, that may present to be like challenges of the ankle joint. So again, I'm just trying to show this anatomy, the trochalcaneo bursa, it's just here, the subcutaneous bursa, it's also here and the heel bone here. So these can be irritated and sometimes you can just have bursitis itself. The bursa itself has, has inflamed. And you also find that uh, this bursa may also present a, a different uh, appearance. Again, clinically, we must know that the treatment of this bursitis and tendinopathy becomes very different. Uh, with consultation, uh, I learned to, to understand that uh, bursitis and tendinopathy have got a different approach when it comes to their treatment. You find that when you have a tendinopathy, they normally don't give uh, steroids. They, they normally inject steroids. Steroids, they normally respond very well in bursitis. So how to sound the diagonizing these conditions that we are talking about, they really change the patient management and their approach to uh, treatment intervention that comes into play. So again, this is a, the anatomy that we are, we are talking about that has to be understood. Uh, you can have that bursitis and then this is still, so major things that are, that causes hang lungs deformity, I've already mentioned. It can occur in both. Symptoms may include a bony bumpy on the back of the ill, severe pain at the Achilles tendon, depending on the, on, the, on, the, on the area that is involved, redness near the inflamed tissue. With our skin color, sometimes you may not appreciate this redness, but the pain may be there that you can feel. Diagnosis, I've already talked about it. Uh, this may not be specific. Uh, considering the complexity of the ankle joint and because symptoms may, 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 may be similar to those that may be associated with other foot pathologies, uh, things like the Achilles tendon itself. But the key major part is that plain x-ray may be requested to, for the ankle diagnostic ultrasound where you may do it as an MSK ultrasound and magnetic resonance may be the last result that may come into play. Uh, technique, what do you use for this? A patient has to be examined in prone, uh, and then you dorsiflex. There's a reason why we dorsiflex. One, you want to stretch the Achilles tendon, particularly in, 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 in sagittal plane, and you also want to avoid anxiotropy. And this anxiotropy is an artifact that is very common in a musculoskeletal ultrasound when the ultrasound beam is not uh, uh, coming into at right, right, right angles to, to the structures around there. So angiotrop may also present like pathologies, like the, the subcutaneous edema, the fluid and around there. So you really have to have this good technique, you dosiflex, a patient, let the patient be put in pronation. Again, I should mention here that when you are doing the whole ankle joint, a patient may also be examined in supine and then you, Externally rotate or medially or laterally, depending on which part you are, you are examining. I mentioned that we have to do the anterior, posterior, lateral, and the medial compartments. But for this particular presentation, we are looking at the posterior evaluation. So the dorsiflexion here becomes very important. 
you need to use a high frequency transducer, at least anything above 10, 10 megahertz. Dosiflexion, the angle to elongate the Achilles tendon, like I've mentioned, and also to avoid the, the anxiotropy that may come. So the patient position is, this is a dosiflexion that we are talking about because the Achilles tendon tends to come here and then comes and inserts at the calcaneal portion. So this is how you are going to see it in the sagittal, sorry, in, this is in sagittal plane. This is the Achilles and this is the calcaneus. And so it will come all the way up to here. And then this is the cagus fat pad. It appears as an echogenic structure just adjacent to the superior portion of the calcaneus. And then you can also have this prominence that you are going to see in sagittal plane. But typically, this is the full length of the, the full thickness of the, the, Achilles tendon, the, the Achilles tendon that comes in and inserts there. So the dosiflexion becomes key. Orthopedic surgeons, they tend to measure all the angles here. I'll show you some of the angles that are considered here for you to consider that there is really a bone enlargement that is that is that that has occurred there. Uh, so no normal posterior ankle heel evaluation sonographically. You have to do uh, your images at two orthogonal planes. You take your sagittal view and the trans transverse view, just like we always, because you are going to see different structures that will appear differently. So how does this Achilles tendon, which is a major structure that inserts there, it will appear as a fairly uh, uniform thickness that will occur with nice fibery appearance that will occur. And anterior to it, you are going to see the subcutaneous soft tissues around it that will occur there. And then just uh, beneath it, which is the retrocalcaneal basta, and the, you are going to see it as an echoic fluid content uh, literature has continues to mention that it will have about, you won't even see, but around 2.5 millimeter of epi diameter of fluid may be considered to be normal within the bursa. Again, when you want to appreciate these bursas, you have to put some, some good adequate fluid or gel, coupling gel just on top of it without compressing the, the, the soft tissue around it. Otherwise, you may displace the fluid within the, the bursa, if it's normal, but if it's abnormal, really, you are going to pick it very well. Transverse view also, it will also show this. Um, when you start from the, the proximal portion, you are going to see the gastronemus, which is laterally, and the soleus, which is medially located. And in between, you are going to have this plantalis that may also run along the Achilles tendon medially. And in about 20%, sometimes you may not find this plantalis that may occur there. So it shouldn't be a surprise if you don't see it, or if you see it, that should not mean that there's a pathology. So really you have to understand the structures that you see in sagittal and in transverse view and how they appear themselves. The Kagas uh, fat pad appears very prominent, especially in, in, in transverse view, and you, are, you may appreciate it as such. So this is the normal insertion. On this one, I just wanted to show the normal insertion as it comes there. So you have to really appreciate this fibre appearance that may appear and the bone contour. You can see that the bone contour is very smooth here as compared to this one. Just wanted to show you how this extrasosis that may appear there. And you can see that there is a difference with this smooth contour that is appearing there with that. So this may typically give you an, an impression that there's something wrong that is going on there. Again, you can also see that this is the Achilles tendon. And then as it comes to insert here, you can see there are also the same extrasources that we are, we are talking about. So you realize that this may affect the insertion and the, and the tendon itself. And the patient may also present with pain due to this bone uh, appearing there. But again, mm -hmm. here you can see that the Achilles tendon is nicely and the bone contour is very smooth. You pick this image simply by doing a dorsiflexion and then you put your transducer in, sag in, in sagittal and you follow it through the length from its origin to its insertion. And you're going to have that impression. Again, I was just trying to show you the subcutaneous, the Achilles tendon itself, the soleus, which runs medially to the Achilles tendon and the Kagas fat pad, how it appears there. 
Okay, this was a, this is a Kagas fat part. This is how it appears quite prominent in transverse. So anterior to the Achilles tendon is a fat part called the Kagas fat part. Distal, it's a small amount of uh, an echoic fluid, about 2.5 epi diameter can be, to, can be noted in the vitrocalcaneal bursa. The side of view plantar aponeurosis, which appears hyper echoic, it may also be uniform and it may measure four millimeters or less in thickness at the calcaneal attachment. It's very important to remember and note where you are measuring this thickness of the plantar aponeurosis of the Achilles tendon, very important. So you measure at the insertion or the attachment site of the calcaneum. Also, you measure the middle thickness and also you measure the proximal thickness. As it comes towards the attachment, it becomes more thicker as compared to where it's coming from, from the origin part. So this is the Kagas part, Kagas part part that I'm, I'm talking about. You can see it becomes very, it's more anterior, more anterior to the Achilles tendon itself. So this is where it actually inserts, but anterior to it, you're also going to see this uh, subcutaneous tissue just around there. Um, there are some few concepts that you need to understand when you are assessing the Achilles tendon. One of them is that the Achilles tendon enlargement greater than one centimeter with significant intrinsic tendon abnormalities may indicate a partial thickness or thickness tear within the so these intrinsic tendon abnormalities we are talking about, once you pick it either in transverse or in sagittal or in, in, in sagittal view, you have to look at the normal appearance of the tendon. Does it have any calcification? Does it have any discontinuity? Does it have any, uh, how is the thickness itself? So this intrinsic assessment together with the, the Achilles enlargement greater than one centimeters may also give you a sign that there's some, something that is happening within the, the Achilles tendon. I mentioned earlier that you also have to consider dynamic assessment. So if you are not very sure, you can either dorsiflex, uh, plant up, you, you, you basically flex and uh, extend the, the ankle joint. Of course, you also have to do it very slow so that you can pick the subtle abnormalities that may appear there so that you are able to assess whether there is a full thickness or a partial thickness. But the key message here is that you have to see that if we, the enlargement is greater than one centimeters with other accompanying abnormalities, consider thickness tear. So partial thickness tears can extend to the surface of the Achilles tendon depending on the portion that has occurred. Dynamic assessment, like I mentioned, by flexing the ankle is very important to demonstrate the tendon fiber continuity so that you can tell what is really happening there. The general comment is that any abnormalities of the Achilles tendon may demonstrate increased color flow on Doppler, increased the power Doppler. You, re you realize that power Doppler is more sensitive than color Doppler when it comes to ultrasound. And color flow may simply give you that sensitivity, but increased the flow may actually be noted well with power Doppler. And then it has also continued to demonstrate that increased blood flow has been shown to represent neovascularity and not an inflammation. So it doesn't mean that when there is a increased color flow, then there is always a, um, an inflammation, but it's also true that it can represent a neovascularity and not the inflammation itself. Uh, so the case number one that I had, this, is, this was a male, male patient, 45, with history of penny for you. Uh, occupation. He was a military personnel, retired. So he presented with the symptoms of acute pain when walking and other vitals were normal and everything. On physical assessment, this patient also had a lot of pain that was being felt when, whenever this patient was walking and being touched. So after assessing the patient, um, this was the the images that we, we, we got on ultrasound, a plain X-ray was done. And the, the thickness here after measurement, you can see it was within normal range. Uh, the Achilles tendon on the other side, we measured it at uh, different levels, both in transverse and in sagittal. So we still got uh, a good 
uh, measurement of six millimeters, five millimeters on different on different views. And then uh, when we picked the other leg, yeah, this was this was a normal leg. Sorry, this was a normal leg. When we went to the, the other leg, this is what uh, we found. There was exosis on the other hand. Then the, the patient, when when you just put the probe just around here, you could feel the patient was having this pain that was clear. When I checked the bursas, all the bursas were, were inflamed. You could tell that they were inflamed. There was a lot of fluid within, in both the subcutaneous and the litrocalcanea bursas, they had this fluid. But these were <coughs> bone protuberance within the aponeurosis portion that we picked, and there was quite a number of fluid with increased color flow, which I will demonstrate. So whenever you put this probe here, the patient could feel this, this pain that was really, really, okay, sorry, I think I'm, I'm missing some images here. Okay, so this patient uh, on color Doppler, there was increased color flow. We also had this bone protuberance that were there and the full thickness of the of the Achilles tendon and the, it was around the 1.8, 1.5 centimeters in thickness. And when I measured the, the mid portion, it was giving me around 1.2, 1.3. And you could tell that this patient had pain just on that. The X-ray did not show much, but we could see there was that speed protuberance. Sorry, I think I'm missing some images some images here, but I'll, I'll, I'll add it. So this patient presented with the, such pain that we could tell, and right on the insertion on the aponeurosis, we could tell that the patient had this pain that was involving and that was coming from there. After assessment, it was further noted that the patient had um, tendinopathy, which was a complex of tendinopathy, hang lungs, deformity, and the bursitis also that was uh, involved. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm unable to share the other two patients. So this patient was uh, noted with uh, that. Hey. Sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll share the images when, when, when I add those, but for the sake of time, I think uh, I'll, Okay. Sorry. Sorry, 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 colleagues. I'm missing some images. Um, okay, let me let me for the sake of time, let me conclude it by saying this, this hang lungs deformity um, basically helps us to understand the anatomy of the Achilles tendon and the, the soft tissue anatomies that may come into play. And as long as we don't understand the anatomy of the ankle joint, the posterior portion, it becomes very challenging to know and take note of the, the synovial joint that may come into play. So you also have to realize that for you to understand this hang lungs deformity, the bony anatomy, the soft tissue anatomy, and the bursas that are involved becomes very handy. And MSK ultrasound becomes very key to, to assess the joint and the bursa abnormalities, the joint effusion, and the synovial hypertrophy that may also come into play. Arthritis changes, arthritic changes may also be assessed and evaluated with within the the bursa and within the bone involved that are there. Sometimes you may also have uh, other abnormalities like peripheral nerve abnormalities that may come into play. Things like the motor neuroma, this is one of the common non-neoplastic lesion that may also involve the plantar, the plantar soft tissues. And that, this may also appear as, as an enlargement of this uh, nerve peripheral abnormalities. And they may appear due to nerve, nerve entrapment within the adjacent soft tissues. Um, and then other interventional procedures that may occur with, the, with this abnormality. You may also go for 
for excision of, of, of these uh, anglans deformities. Sometimes you may also have uh, procedures that may involve injection of steroids within the abnormalities like the basitis direct there under ultrasound guided. So this may also present as, as, a, as a big challenge when it comes to other treatments that may come into play. So the take home message is that these hang lungs deformity, whenever we see an X, a plain X-ray with an abnormal bone protuberance or enlargement, we may pick our ultrasound and see what is the soft tissue telling us and then also check the bone bone appearance and what else may be happening within the litrocalcania or the bursa itself. This may also help us to have a conclusive report when it comes to ultrasound of the musculoskeletal, the, the soft tissue, so that we, we give guidance to clinicians who may come to, to, to play. So, and this, these were my reference, references. So I'm so sorry about the, the images, but in my editing, I'll, I'll include them. So I'll end my presentation from here, unless there are any questions that we may discuss. So thank you so much for your attention. I'll end the discussion here. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Mlinga, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, it has indeed showed uh, uh, you know the advantages of uh, ultrasound in uh, diagonizing uh, or something which can surface uh, uh, on top of a plain x-ray to diagonize angles at uh, deformity. So thank you once more. At this point in time, I think uh, we can open for discussion or any questions. Uh, the floor is open. Kindly raise your hands and we'll be able to identify you. Thank you. Are there any questions or contributions? Oh, people are, they are sleeping. <laughs> any contributions, comments, any experience regarding this condition? I can see uh, two hands from uh, Trinis and uh, Annette. So we'll start with Annette and Trinis. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I, 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 I'm just actually giving a word of thanks. A thank you to the presenter. I think he has been precise and uh, <laughs> accurate on the presentation and I've really picked out something and I'm sure other colleagues have also picked up, out, up something. Since like for us at school, there are some things they, read, they did not really elaborate well for us, but this gives us an idea. So thank you so much. It's just my comment that I was putting in. Thank you, you're welcome. You're welcome, madam. Thank you so much. Chinese, you can... Any, any, any experience? Oh, there's another, there's another hand. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, good evening. Thank you so much, Mr. Carpet, for this presentation. I just want to ask, I joined in when you had already started. Uh, let's say you, you've done an X-ray, then you have seen uh, this bony protuberance, this bony outgrowth, the calcaneum spares, um, can these ones be linked to this deformity as well? Then the other question is on, uh, is there a relationship with these uh, bony outgrowths and plantar fasciitis? Thank you. Thank you so much. And just to quickly respond to that, um, hanglands deformities, uh, 
like I mentioned, it's a bone enlargement of the superior portion of the calcaneus. So when it when 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 it comes to the bone, the bone spar themselves typically, you find that depending on where they have they have outgrown, like the bone spar itself. Like I mentioned in my presentation, sometimes it's very, very, very difficult, very difficult when a patient presents with certain symptoms. You may not know, not until you assess the, the, actual, the actual abnormalities that are there. So a bone spur itself may irritate a certain soft tissue around it, but hang lungs deformity typically it will affect the superior portion of the calcaneal bone. So that may also have a bone spur. Besides the enlargement of that portion, there is also a bone spur. That may give you other, they may coexist, if I may say that, they may coexist. But a bone spur alone without an enlargement of the, the superior portion of the, without that bone enlargement of the calcaneal bone may not really qualify to be hang lungs deformity. However, it must be noted that you may have an irritation or pain on the posterior heel with, with you, you may not have pain, sorry, you may not have pain despite having that bone enlargement, you may not have pain, but you may have a bone spur that may actually be irritating that. So literature has continued to say they may coexist, but it's very important to ensure that you pinpoint the hang lungs deformity and there are measurements that are done to confirm that really this is hang lungs deformity with the clinical history of, of, of pain that may come. Fasciitis, you've talked about fasciitis. Yes, fasciitis may also be correlated or linked to a bone spur, particularly those spur that tends to be on the inferior portion of the, of the, of the calcaneal bone. So that may irritate still the, the the planter the planter the planter ligament just down there which may present as fasciitis so like i mentioned the ankle joint abnormalities being a complex thing they may present a challenge and the the diagnosis can only be made once accurate imaging assessment is done so yes plantar fasciitis is related to bone spur but hang lungs deformity has to be involved with the bone enlargement. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, are there any other questions or contributions? Others may also even experience it. Uh, I joined late, I joined very late, uh, otherwise it was a very good presentation, uh, a lot of things have been said by the boss there, we appreciate the great knowledge, but uh, boss I joined late, I wanted to ask on the calcaneal spa, mm, in case of calcaneal spa, can it also be linked to that, In cases of calcaneal spa, can also ultrasound help in uh, whether there's some inflammations or um, anything to do with the, the same condition we've been discussing? Okay, I'm just from responding. Uh, I think it's very important once you see a calcaneal spa, anatomically, you find that uh, that spa that outgrows there it's attached to a tendon and that tendon sometimes it can be irritated due to that attachment or that relationship so the pain may be presenting the patient may be having referred pain not necessarily that the patient has got hang lungs deformity but the pain may be coming due to that acute inflammation of the calcaneal spur so that may be a separate thing no wonder i mentioned that uh, hang lungs deformity Typically, you have to assess the posterior portion of the knee. Sorry, the posterior portion of the, of the ankle joint. So 
that may also require other assessment of the planter aspect of the of the food and basically to see you may not have more information or adequate information but that may also give you some information about it depending on the auto sound machine you, use, you may pick something but mri still will come and play a role to that but it's very important when you see a calcaneous sperm you go up also you see what is happening within the the retrocalcaneal uh, bursa and the subcutaneous bursa and also just to see what is happening with the aponeurosis the insertion site of the achilles tendon you may pick something from there so fasciitis is the inflammation of the, the the tendon that attaches to the, the the interior portion of the of the the calcaneus and in most cases calcaneus part they tend to to grow from there so yes it may help but it may not really mean that there is hand glands deformity thank you thank you so much thank you thank you mr mlenga i hope mr vincent uh sakara that is clear we can go to toe uh, thank you so much good evening everyone i would like just to say that uh, it's been a good presentation mr cuthbert and quite quite clear as well um also just to re-echo when you're doing these examinations import importantly really is for you to know the anatomy like he has expressed and also being able to collaborate what you see on x-ray and what you see on um, ultrasound. But also just to take us back a little on the person who asked about uh, plantar fasciitis as well as this condition that we're looking at this evening. So also just in case as you are scanning, you get a bit confused as to whether you're dealing with uh, plantar fasciitis so you're dealing with uh, this syndrome. If you look at the anatomy, you discover that the plantar fascia is really on the sole of the foot where you are stepping on. Whilst the other one, we're talking about the Achilles tendon and where it, it um, inserts. So when you're scanning, typically you realize that when it's for plantar fasciitis, your probe has to be literally on the sole of the foot. And that's where you're able to do all those measurements. And then when you're dealing with the Hangland syndrome, your probe is a bit uh, superior like we saw in this. Uh, so they may be related, but you're able to make uh, quite a good distinction, especially when you're scanning and depending on where your probe is. So like he said, importantly, your anatomy comes into play. You need to know uh, what tendon, uh, what fascia am I looking at um, uh, right now? So that was my uh, contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Toela. That's very important points too. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Toela. Any other questions and contributions? It seems the presentation was very clear. Our oh, people are in the weekend mood. It's either they are in the weekend mood. So. <laughs> okay, I think maybe I, I can see our president is on the call. I can see Dr. Wanga. Maybe we can have just some few words from uh, them. As well as uh, Atupele. Mr. Kapapa, really? Do you have to call me out? <laughs> okay. Catherine, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. It was really clear and straightforward. I have a question for you though. Um, statistically, how common is a Hanglands uh, syndrome? Mm -hmm. Just a quick one. I may not have the documented, but so far, uh, hmm. What I've seen in my hospital, um, 
in real time, I think the condition is it's, it's quite common. Maybe out of 20, I would say maybe eight, eight or seven may have that condition. The, the, the other surprising part is that people may have this, but because they have adopted to that, so they don't actually have that pain. So doing a research, I think we can have more, more information, but it's a very common because if I could pick out of five, I picked three patients who had that. So it became a concern to me. So really, I think the, the statistics are quite, they, they may be quite high, considering that this is a lifestyle, occupational kind of disease or deformity that may come. So we need to do research, but so far, uh, inferentially, you can tell that this may be a common, common condition. Okay, I ask that just because uh, on my end, because we do a lot of, uh, we see a lot of orthopedic patients. Yes. yes and yes, we yes. do x-rays. Um, yeah. We have, I personally haven't come across it that much. Okay. And uh, maybe unless they, they send them to a specific center where they actually get their scanning done. Yes. So that's why I wanted to know whether it's more common on that end versus this side. So that's why I just wanted to know. Okay. okay. Yeah, but otherwise, uh, the, the, the mm -hmm. other thing I, I spoke to, the, the cases that I had, I spoke to an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he actually said he normally sees them quite uh, a lot, but they normally don't come with pain, per se. They will just discover them. And then, because even the treatment with this, it's very, very rare that they will go for surgery. And their treatment protocols actually it can range from, from from quite from six to one year sometimes when they are on medication. So he sees them quite often, but most of them, they are not prepared for imaging. That's what he actually said. I asked that question, but he said they're quite common, but half the time they don't come for imaging. Okay, that makes sense because like, as I said, personally, I haven't come across a lot of cases on my side. So it okay. means they're probably treated a certain way in such a, a way that they're not, they don't come for imaging so it that explains a lot exactly so on the zambian side does it mean that uh, uh they because the cases that you've come across they've been specifically referred to you is it yes 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 yes, yes. okay that's fine thank you so much but the topic was amazing how are you though i'm all right how are you madam i'm good <laughs> okay thank you thank you, thank you so much welcome thank you thank you <laughs> Uh, evening, Mr. President and um, uh, FG. I don't uh, really want to say anything, but uh, all I want to say is that uh, it was uh, very insightful and very informative. But I got interested when you mentioned to say there is um, uh, one of the pre-depositing factors to the same condition is that uh, uh, wearing high, high, high heels, the heels you call, so I was just laughing to myself that we, maybe we should sensitize our people, our friends, uh, to stop wearing such kind of shoes. I don't know if that will work out. But I always, all in all, uh, it was a great presentation, very informative. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mulinga. That's what I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, boss. Uh, I think he, you, you are right because the, when, when, when literature has continued to emphasize, especially on the, it's on the, the type of shoes, really it has really, when you go in the literature, they have emphasized the type of shoes and how much you irritate your Achilles tendon and together with the, with the, fasci, the, 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 the fascia tendon, all these, the, the straining and the stretching, all those. So our colleagues, uh our 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 women i think it, it becomes very important to be at least be aware on the, how much you adopt to this you may adopt high yield and then so really it's, it's an important thing even just talking to our 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 wives for those of us with wives i think 
you never know. You may help somebody with these conditions. So, sir, I think you are right. We need to sensitize people. <laughs> But now I can come in. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cuthbert Mulenga. This was a very, very interesting presentation. Like, like the, the way you said, we can see this is one of the areas of, of research where we can generate the, the Zambian literature. And again, is the, the areas for clinical audits and, uh, and, the, case, uh, and the case reports. Yes, so th thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. And how are you? Long time. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. We, we will take note of those points, sir, and we may generate some information regarding exactly. that. Exactly. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Is Mr. Chimfuembe here? I don't think he's, 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 he's around. I haven't seen him, I doubt. Okay. Yeah, okay, so thank you once more, Mr. Mulinga, for this presentation. Uh, let me just make a quick comment. Um, there's someone who, who was saying um, Angler's deformity can easily be picked on X-ray, which is uh, true, uh, but we can't run away from the fact that it can be picked on X-ray. So this presentation actually, uh, shows that uh, ultrasound can um, can actually give you more information uh, than a plain x-ray. So uh, once more, thank you for this presentation, Mr. Murenga, we'll call you again. And uh, I'd like to thank you everyone who logged in, unless there are any other contributions Uh, kindly raise your hand or uh, just unmute yourself and you can uh, contribute before we close. Okay, it seems there, there are no more contributions or any questions. So thank you everyone. We'll be having another presentation in the next two weeks. Uh, it will be, I think, I think the topic will be shared on different uh, WhatsApp platforms. And you, uh, those who are not on those uh, platforms, you will receive the same way you received this one. So thank you once more and uh good night thank you so much good night